Okay, special topic number four is going to be today and tomorrow, I think. It's a long special topic, but a lot of very interesting chemistry I think you guys will enjoy. Okay, cancer, you all basically know what cancer is. Uh, the, the one outstanding common denominator, because you might have a hundred different types of cancer. Every different kind of cell really has its own cancer, its own tumor. The common denominator, the unchecked proliferation of cell growth, and this is normally what will kill the cancer patient. Two types of tumors, you don't have to know this, we're not gonna really get into this, you'll get this in medical school, a carcinoma and sarcoma, depending on the type of tissue. The characteristics of cancer, unlike normal cells, it can basically grow forever, or, or as long as the host is alive. And there's some record tumor growth, so I'll show you on the next slide. It's like an alien thing that's in you. It's, it's really, uh, it's abnormal, it's, totally independent of the organism, as it turns out, even though it's derived from normal cells in you. It's a very ugly disease, as you'll see. It can grow for a long time, stop for a while, grow back again, and so on. And what normally kills you, in fact, is the invasion of normal tissues and the spread, metastases, uh, away from the original tumor. Here's some very large tumors that affected people but obviously didn't kill them. They, were, they did not affect a vital organ, as you can see. Very large tumors. And the record is a 300-pound tumor on a person. Yeah, if you have any questions, just... One more time, I'm sorry. What's the difference between like benign tumors and... Well, malignant tumors tend to spread. I think that's the main difference. These are probably all benign tumors. I would guess, yeah. This is what they look like. These are mouse breast cancer cells. You can see they have a large number of chromosomes, abnormally large number of chromosomes. The nucleus is often very large, as you can see. And, and the outgrowth, you have these blebs that actually make the cancer really very ugly and very dark. Some more breast cancer cells. These cells have been uh, immortalized since 1951. This was cancer of the cervix that this woman had in 1951, and these cells can be uh, reproduced and studied for cancer research since 1951. They're basically immortal. As we're gonna see, you can have a normal cell, and you can watch this under a microscope, become a cancer cell. And once it does, it, of course, divides, and this is the beginning. You can actually count the number of cancer cells in this stomach cancer in a rabbit over at Hitchcock, where these are normal cells here, and then eventually it gets much larger, of course, and finally is manifested in a gross tumor. And this slide illustrates, in fact, it's very difficult to operate on many cancers surgically. Difficult to take out the tumor because it's not just a well-defined tumor, it's a bunch of little tiny tumors. As you can see, all of these lumpy areas are cancer in the stomach. Here's another case. This is a mouse lung. The mouse was given vinyl carbamate, a tumor, a urethane. We, we talked about the carbamate functional group. After 20 weeks, and you can see all of these white lumps are cancer. You can't take it out of the lung without destroying the lung. Now we talked about CDDO, our magical compound that we, we developed actually or synthesized for the first time in 1998. This is a mouse, the lucky one that was given one of our compounds after the same period and vinyl carbamate, and you can see smaller tumors and much fewer in number. We're very excited about these compounds at preventing cancer. Okay, the cause of cancer selection theory is that the cancer cell is always developing in us, but it takes special conditions in order to convert that one cancer cell into a tumor. Viral theory, we'll talk a lot about this, as you'll see, lots of cancers now, especially in Africa, are caused by viruses, including HIV and, uh, and hepatitis viruses as well. But we're mainly gonna talk about carcinogen theory, the fact that certain chemicals will induce a change in a single normal cell into a cancer cell, and then that will spread and divide. We're gonna talk about nitrosamines, and these are 
ubiquitous in things we eat and smoke, of course. Bends pyrene when you burn wood, it contains carbon and chlorine, or chloride, you form these compounds. Aflatoxin is the most toxic naturally occurring carcinogen known. Azobenzene, it's, it's an azo dye related to the aromatic amines. So these are the five groups of compounds. There may be one or two more we'll talk about as well. But the major classes of compounds known to cause cancer in animals, probably in man, for sure in man with aromatic amines, if the dose is enough. The interesting thing is not all of these carcinogens cause cancer in all different animal types. Aflatoxin is very carcinogenic in rats, but not in monkeys, not in mice. Guinea pigs, which are the most susceptible animal to dioxin, as we talked about before, don't get cancer, in fact, from these aromatic amines, as you can see. Very interesting. You don't have to really know any of this. I just wanted to point that out, that not every animal species is susceptible to these carcinogens. Yeah. They're not that similar, I would say, yeah. But I'm not a biologist, but that's what I would, I would say based on that evidence, yeah. Rats are larger, that I can say for sure, than mice. <laughs> okay, let's look at some statistics from the American Cancer Society, unless you have any questions so far. And I have a copy of this. I have the 2016 version, I think, that you're welcome to take, <clears throat> welcome to look at. Number of new cases, well over a million, as you can see, predicted for 2013. And about a third of the people diagnosed will die from cancer, at least in that year. Now, cures are in quotes because it's defined as a five-year remission. But the cancer can come back after five years. That's why it's in quotes. But if you're cancer-free for five years, it's a good chance you are cancer-free. And again, most of you probably have been affected, not directly, I hope, but family members or friends have cancer, uh, or have had cancer at least. And you can see it affects lots of people in this country and abroad. Okay, looking at trends in cancer, uh, cancer death rates in males, lung cancer, major killer, but now men realize it's not good to smoke. Cancer death rates started to decline. Stomach cancer has been on the decline since 1930. In this country in particular, has the lowest cancer death rate from stomach cancer in any country in the world, mainly because of improved diet, refrigeration techniques, and an awareness of, of a healthy uh, lifestyle as well. Uh, colon cancer is declining colonoscopies, of course. Prostate cancer in men because of the PSA test. Uh, and breast cancer in women also, on the next slide you'll see, because of mammograms. Cancer of the pancreas, very bad cancer, remained fairly constant. Liver cancer, fairly constant as well. Yeah? One more time, a little bit louder. Why was there a spike in prostate I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah. Does this mean that like, overall cancer death rate is decreasing? Yes, yes. And this goes out, as you can see, to 2000, at least 11 or so. In females, again, a lot of women started smoking well after men, of course, but now they're realizing not so good. So in fact, that's declining. Breast cancer is on the decline, mammograms in particular, colon cancer for the same reason with men. And again, stomach cancer also. Uterine cancer, the pap test, very important test for women. Uh, you can see the decline there in death rates. OK, this is a breakdown of the types of cancer in this country. And you can see the, the big four in males and females, males, females, and lung cancer and colon cancer. Uh, the deaths are, are fairly modest compared to the number of cases diagnosed in prostate cancer, easy to detect, fairly easy to treat, and breast cancer as well. Lung cancer, very difficult to treat, as you can see. And cancer of the colon as well. Notice cancer of the pancreas. If you're diagnosed with cancer of the pancreas, uh, you, you have a, a very small chance of surviving five years. 
You can see number of cases diagnosed, number of cancer deaths. Ovarian cancer is also fairly serious in women, as you can see. And melanoma is, if it's detected before it spreads, before it goes down in you, is fairly easy to, uh, to cure, to detect, and prevent death. <clears throat> okay, looking at cancer death rate by state, southeastern states, a lot of smoking, air pollution, heavy alcohol use, mainly smoking, very high cancer death rates, males and females. Much lower in the northeast, by a bit anyway, and then out west, very, very low. Good lifestyle out here, and of course in Utah, uh, no smoking, no coffee, no cigarettes, uh, lots of sex. It's very, very low rate because of the Mormons. Very low death rates, as you can see. No, I think this is right. I think this is right. Okay, breaking this down to lung cancer, again, you can see the southeastern states, a lot of smoking, heavy, heavy lung cancer death rates by comparison to the western states. And here's a map that shows that. You can see that the dark blue is the bad area. Cancer death rate's very high. This spike is due, I think, to asbestos. It's in that part of California, north of Sacramento. I'll show that later. Also, there is an asbestos mine up here in Libby, Montana, in this part of, of Idaho, over here as well. I think it's due to uh, that exposure. Okay, looking at cancer incidence and death rates as it's changed from 1974 to the present time, you can see lung cancer is going way down in males. It, it's still a major leading cause of death in males, prostate cancer is, is going down as well by comparison, at least here. Colon cancer going down as well. The big change has been in females with regard to smoking. As you can see, lung cancer was very low in terms of incidence in 1974, but you can see it's nearly tripled now and it is the leading cause of cancer death in women, as it turns out. Okay, this slide is really important. This slide emphasizes how, how important it is for early diagnosis. Now, if the tumor is localized, we can just look at this column, localized, your chances of living five years are very high for most types of cancer, as you can see. Very, very high, except for liver cancer and cancer of the pancreas, these guys down here. But once it's spread outside of the primary tumor into a lymph node, let's say, then you can see things get a little bit worse, a lot worse here, for example. Cancer of the pancreas goes way down. And then if it's spread beyond the original tumor and the lymph nodes, then your chances of living five years go way, way down, especially for the ones in red, as you can see. So early diagnosis, pap test, PSA if you're a male, over the age of 50, colonoscopy over the age of 50, you know, you really have to pay attention to that, to those things. Okay, these are the, the risk of factors. <clears throat> Cigarette smoking obviously is involved with lung cancer, but lots of other, other factors as well. Tuberculosis, for example, exposure to chemicals like benzene maybe, colon cancer, aging, and genetics. And those factors are involved in a lot of these tumors. Family history, and you've all read about this, and this is certainly true. Also true breast cancer and obesity for a lot of these tumors. Fat intake, you can see, is, is involved in lots of these. Bladder cancer, about half, is probably due to smoking, in fact. And chemical exposure, as we'll talk about later. Leukemia, again, family history, bad genes, chemical exposure like benzene, and, and so on. And again, the papillomavirus involved in uterine cancer uh, to some extent, and also in, in cancers in Africa, as we'll see. Any questions about any of this? Okay, obesity didn't used to be a big problem. 1992, you can see the, the obesity incidence was uh, certainly less than 50% in most states, 
But now in 2005, every state but Colorado has more than 55% of the population, of adult population, is obese, as you can see. Well, Colorado and also Hawaii here. Tobacco smoke, thousands of compounds. 5,000 compounds have been identified alone, and it's estimated there are 100,000 compounds in tobacco smoke. And in fact, if you burn anything, you get thousands and thousands of compounds. Most are in the gas phase, but some are in the particulates that you've read about, I think. We're going to talk a lot about polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These were first discovered to cause cancer in animals, at least. Nitrosamines are also in tobacco smoke, aromatic amines, and lots of other things that we've talked about in this course. Okay, let's go around the world and look at different types of cancer worldwide. This is now the overall cancer death rate by country, Eastern European countries, very high cancer death rates. And also, a lot of this has to do with treatment options. They're not as good as they are in this country, for example. But heavy smoking, heavy drinking, air pollution in these, in these countries really conspires, I think, to give them a very, very high cancer death rates. U.S. is in the top third even higher for females. These countries, this is due mainly to uh, hepatitis viruses in parts of Africa and Denmark. We're not really sure why Denmark and New Zealand in females have very high cancer death rates. Part of it is related to lung cancer and then breast cancer. So breaking it down to lung cancer, again, these countries, very high death rates. U.S. is somewhat lower and again, Denmark with a female lung cancer. U.S., because of smoking, now ranks number two in the country, in, in the world, for lung cancer death rates in, in women. Let me show you what lung cancer is. I know most of you will get to medical school, learn about this, I'm sure. This is a normal looking lung of an infant who apparently died from something else. A normal clean lung during surgery, emphysema, COPD, or you really damage the lung, not cancer, but very serious disease, obviously. Normal lung tissue, lung tissue of a smoker. You can see the tissue is literally dissolved. It's much like putting acetone in a styrofoam cup. It, it just actually dissolves. Lung cancer during surgery, again, this illustrates the fact, the fact that you can't operate, as far as I know, on lung cancer. It's everywhere in the lung in the lung of a smoker. It's hard to see, but again, these are a pair of lungs here, and all of these lumpy things are tumor. You just can't operate to save that, that animal in that case. Stomach cancer, this is now very interesting. Costa Rica, males and females, the highest stomach cancer death rate in the world. We think it's due to the formation, the fact that they mine Nitrite, NO2. We'll talk about these compounds and how they cause nitrosamines in males and females. As you can see, it gets into the drinking water and gets into the food. And moreover, it's, it gets oxidized to nitrate. Now, nitrate is not a carcinogen, doesn't lead to compounds that cause cancer. But in fact, uh, nitrates can also be then be reduced back to nitrites. The nitrites are the bad ones. This is also true in Chile and China. They, they produce a lot of nitrites, in fact, and, and uh, Japan as well. Again, the US is in, uh, is in the bottom, males and females, for stomach cancer death rates. Colon cancer, we're down fairly low for males and females. Again, these Eastern European countries are fairly high, as you can see, the cancer death rates. If you have any questions, just kind of yell out. Uh, breast cancer in women, again, Denmark is very high. The U.S. is, say, in the top third or so. Prostate cancer, 
in males. I, these countries, again, might have to do with treatment. They don't have a access to the PSA test, for example. Cancer of the esophagus, a very bad kind of cancer, not unlike uh, cancer of the pancreas, very difficult to treat, even though it can be detected early on, have a hard time swallowing, but it's very difficult to treat to stop it. We think it's due in part to aflatoxin, this mold metabolite we'll talk about, high in both males and females. U.S. is fairly low. And also heavy drinking, drinking concentrated alcohol. 40% alcohol is, is uh, typical for vodka, gin, and whiskey. That's very, very corrosive to the tissues. So if your parents like full strength alcohol, whiskey, it should be diluted with water or Coke or something. The, the pure alcohol is very corrosive to the tissues of the esophagus. Liver cancer, China is number one, and almost certainly we think this is due to either aflatoxin exposure, which is abundant, as it turns out, in China, and also the nitrosamines that, that are formed from nitrite, as we'll see. And again, the U.S. is down fairly low for liver cancer. Also, viruses are responsible for these high rates, uh, rates in uh, parts of Africa. Okay, let's talk about viruses more. In fact, this is really on the increase, as it turns out, mainly because of HIV and AIDS. Liver cancer, very large number of cases every year are reported. And these viruses are implicated in the liver cancer and also cancer of the stomach. Cervical cancer as well, again, the papilloma virus is very common in women, obviously, but it, it doesn't always get manifested into cancer, as you can see. Stomach cancer is related to this bacterium that causes uh, ulcers in the stomach, Heliobacter, and has also now been implicated in cancer of the stomach. A Kaposi sarcoma is a very common cancer in uh, gay men, as it turns out. It's now been linked to this herpes virus 8 and also HIV. Very common in these parts of Africa, this uh, sarcoma. And this is what it looks like. Uh, not this. This is the bacterium. And this is Kaposi sarcoma, as you can see. And it, it eventually can be fatal. HIV also, it's, it's on the decline now because of good drugs that we have, but still it, it's a problem, again, mainly in Africa. It started in the Cameroons, we think, back in the early 1900s, and then spread, and you can see it still is a major problem, although that's now more than 10 years ago. started up here, although Cameroon is here. They think now it started here and then kind of spread to different parts of Africa. This, again, goes way back to 1920, up to the early 60s, and then, of course, is essentially worldwide. Hepatitis C virus is a very common virus, and again, it can lead to cancer of the liver. Skin cancer, very, very common. Of course, it's easy to detect, fairly easy to treat. Uh, unless it's melanoma, that's the one that can be fatal if it's not treated right away. And again, it's, it's the bad one, especially in, in these countries, South Africa, the, the white population, because near the equator, lots of sunshine. This part of Australia, where you have the Great Barrier Reef, Lots of sunshine, people who live there, fair-skinned people, they have a very high incidence of melanoma, as do the Irish, of course, the fair-skinned Irish. It's due to 
UV radiation, and this is what it looks like, melanoma. It's, you've probably seen these photographs. It's, it's very dark and lumpy, different uh, colorations. And these are the ABCDE melanoma, asymmetric cell, irregular borders, different color variation and it evolves over time, as you can see. And what happens, of course, eventually it will then go down into you and then spread. So it's very important to get this looked at by a dermatologist uh, as soon as you get anything that looks like this. It's on the rise in this country, mainly due to tanning beds. And you can see how it's increased from 1973 to 2004. The number of cases in women is more than doubled. <clears throat> and what happens, this is a chemical reaction you may have had in, in Chem 51. If it turns out, if you irradiate an alkene of any type, and we'll look at ethylene, you get a cyclobutane, and this is what happens to pieces of your DNA that are exposed to sun. You get this, this 2 plus 2 cycloaddition that is allowed to go by, by light, not by heat, as it turns out. And now, once you get this, this is a major damage to the DNA, and this can lead to a mutation and cancer in the skin. Okay, any questions about that introduction? Okay, the first group of compounds found to cause cancer, in animals at least, probably in man, goes way back to 1775, when an English doctor, Dr. Pott, noticed high scrotal cancer in chimney sweeps. These were men, small men, boys would go into chimneys and scrape out the soot and the creosote, the tars, it would get on their skin, on their clothes, they wouldn't bathe, and they would get this very rare kind of cancer that then spread in their bodies and they died. Now, now he didn't know that the chemicals were involved, but, but knew that the soot, the black tar in your fireplace, which you never want to touch, by the way, was causing this cancer. But it wasn't really developed until the Japanese in 1915, a long time period, induced the same kinds of, of a cancer of the skin in, in animals by taking tar and putting the tar on their skin. Very obvious experiment to do, but it took a long time to do that. And then in 1925 in London, Kennaway induced the same kinds of cancers in animals, mainly on the skin. Again, by making tars, by burning organic material, taking the tars, putting those on skin. But then Kennaway, and this was a major breakthrough, in 1929 got the same kinds of cancers in animals taking a synthetic hydrocarbon this dibenzanthracene. Now, anthracene, as I think you know, you know what naphthalene is. Anthracene is three benzene rings in a row. So dibenzanthracene is two benzene rings, di for two, one here and one here. And, and the way you label this, this is the A side of anthracene, and you simply go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. So this is dibenz AH anthracene. That's a compound Kennaway synthesized, and, and he had a lot of compounds to test. He found that that one compound produced the same kinds of uh, cancer of the skin, skin cancer, that the TARS induced earlier, that were uh, discovered early on. And then also at about the same time, also in, in England, they decided to isolate the chemicals in coal tar. So they took seven tons of coal, burned it down to this black gooey mess, extracted it, and isolated seven grams of this compound. This is benzpyrene. Now, pyrene is this compound, having four rings. That's not a carcinogen, as it turns out. But this compound is. And this is formed when you burn anything. We're breathing some of this right now. Because again, molecules are really small, especially in the wintertime when people are burning wood. You're, you're forming benzpyrene. And again, as I said, this is formed when you burn anything. Very potent carcinogen. 
you can see very dilute solution gave skin cancer to most of these mice. Any questions about this so far? Here are some of the other compounds that Kenaway had in the laboratory. He synthesized. None of these did anything to the mice. It's only certain arrangements of benzene rings. So these are not carcinogenic. This one is marginally carcinogenic. You could see it took a long time to get one tumor and maybe a whole bunch of mice. <clears throat> these are some of the compounds found in coal tar. These are all in your fireplace, your parents' fireplace. So you don't want to, again, touch that with your, with your fingers. The ones in red are the bad ones. Ben's anthracene is this. Again, anthracene, Ben's anthracene, so actually Ben's A anthracene, dibenz anthracene, and Ben's pyrene. And it turns out, and we'll get into this more, to be carcinogenic, the minimum that you have to have with a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon are four benzene rings in this particular shape. Again, this is anthracene. And if you have this arrangement, it will be carcinogenic. Now, benzpyrene, of course, has another ring, has a fifth ring here. But that also fits this criterion, having four rings in that shape, three in a row and then one up at an angle. And if you have that arrangement, chances are the compound would, will be a carcinogen, provided, and I'll get into this more, that this ring, sorry, this ring here without the extra one, is unsubstituted, and it, meaning it doesn't have methyls or halogens in this ring. You can have other things over here, but if this ring is unsubstituted, with this basic arrangement, the compound will cause cancer. So let me summarize that, I think, on the next slide. Okay, these compounds don't cause cancer. Now, the one exception is this guy here. See, it has that arrangement, but the extra ring is here. So this is a, an exception to what I just said, the only exception. Compounds on the left are carcinogenic. The ones on the right are not. So this is benzpyrene, and if you, if you look at it, here is the arrangement. Here's the extra ring, and this ring is unsubstituted. And that, is, well, that's important, as you'll see in just a minute. Yeah? Well, that's the exception I just said. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's this guy here. <clears throat> okay, nature makes a lot of these compounds. These are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons found in plants and in they all have oxygens around the ring, and that actually prevents them from causing cancer. And here's the benzpyrene. Again, benzpyrene is, is the bad one. That's the one that has this ring here. But again, it, it has oxygens around the ring. Now, naphthalene is not a carcinogen. It occurs naturally. I've mentioned this before. It's produced by termites to repel ants, we think. It's a component of magnolia flowers, attracts insects for pollination, but not for feeding. Now, now these compounds, fortunately, the one in red on the upper left is not formed when you burn things because it turns out to be the most carcinogenic of any polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. It never fails to induce cancer in an animal. A hundred mice, or sorry, a thousand mice were given this compound, all 1,000 developed cancer. The diethyl compound here is not a carcinogen. Very interesting difference. If you have now a mixture, methyl ethyl, then it's sort of in between, at least for this compound. But fortunately, this 712 dimethyl benzanthracene uh, is not a carcinogen. Let me just show you how this is numbered, actually. The numbering begins here goes around the ring, skipping the positions that can't have a substituent. So 
712 dimethylbenzanthrocine. It operates by a different mechanism, as you'll see, but fortunately, it's, it's not produced, as far as we can tell, when you burn things. Okay, well, the early theory of, as to how these things cause cancer is that it's somehow interacting with your DNA, causing a mutation, and then that is manifested into a tumor. So it was thought that you're somehow disrupting the base pairing that you've all learned about in biology courses here or in high school, where you have guanosine, guanine, hydrogen bond to a cytosine, adenosine to a thymine. And this is what holds our DNA together, of course. But going way back, it wasn't known when Watson and Crick in the 50s were trying to determine the structure of DNA. In fact, they were operating under the assumption that the base pairing, that again holds the double helix together, uh, was involved, uh, well, using the wrong tautomeric forms. Now, Rosalind Franklin had some beautiful x-ray pictures of DNA. Unfortunately, she would have shared the Nobel Prize, we think, had she not died of, of ovarian cancer in 1958. So Watson and Crick got the Nobel Prize for the, the discovery of DNA, but it was based on her x-ray pictures. What Watson and Crick were doing that was wrong, they were trying to figure out DNA, trying to match the x-ray data of Franklin by base pairing a G with a G and a T with a T. And if, if you look at these models, these models are very different in shape, and they didn't match the beautiful symmetry of the DNA molecule that, that Franklin determined by X-ray. The correct scheme is actually, as you know probably, G with C and A with T, and these are about the same shape, same size, as you can see, AT, GC. Watson and Crick were relying on an old organic chemistry text that showed the wrong tautomeric forms of the bases, of two of the bases, as you'll see, an A and a T. Jerry Donahue, class of 1941, who took chemistry in 006 Steel, went to England and corrected the tautomeric forms, this is the true story, the tautomeric forms of Watson and Crick. And what he realized, and what Watson and Crick didn't realize, is that the tautomeric forms in the pyridine type bases are not the hydroxypyridine, this case and that case, but rather, as you guys saw in the last exam, the keto forms, the keto forms. In fact, this was on the last exam, this exact example. It's simply more stable. The carbonyl and the NH outweigh the aromatic ring and the OH. And so when you make this correction, taking the wrong G and, and T forms they were using, Watson and Crick, do the correct forms that Jerry Donahue said, those are the wrong forms when he looked at the models on the desk. It should be like this. Then you get the beautiful match of DNA. So now, how do these things, benzpyrene, how do they cause cancer? The early theory was, in fact, they intercalate DNA. And what that means is that these planar bases, this thing is flat, like dioxin. It slips in between adjacent base pairs and causes somehow a mutation. Either by, because of the size of this thing, it causes a frame shift mutation, where when the DNA here replicates, you get an extra base here because it has nothing to hydrogen bond to. So this shifts the entire code of the DNA down by one. It's a major mutation. And in fact, we know that this is the case with the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. This is the origin of cancer in these animals and in the chimney sweeps. Or the other possibility is that the presence of this lumpy base in, in here causes a point mutation where now thymine rather than cytosine will hydrogen bond to a guanine. That's a point mutation. And of course, now the DNA that has replicated up here is wrong. It has an incorrect base pair at one site. And then that will make the wrong protein by way of the RNA, of course, and that 
is called the point mutation. Okay, then things stayed like that for a while. Then in 1970, down at NIH in Bethesda, Maryland, Bernie Whitkop discovered, he was looking with, with a lot of these compounds, including the simple ones like naphthalene. He gave this to a rat and isolated the epoxide, naphthalene epoxide, the first time anybody had found a metabolite of any kind of polycyclic or aromatic hydrocarbon. He isolated this and found, in fact, that it undergoes what's called the NIH shift, where this directly goes to either the 2-hydroxy or the 1-hydroxy naphthalene. Now, epoxides can do that. They can break open because of ring strain, and then the proton is lost, and that gives the naphthol, the hydroxy naphthalenes. You don't have to know that mechanism. Or you can get hydration. As we saw in the last exam, epoxides open up in a trans fashion, trans diol in this case, and then you can lose water. So you actually isolate these compounds. So then right away, people thought, well, maybe that's what's going on here. These are getting epoxidized first, and that's what's reacting with the DNA, not the bare hydrocarbon itself. The early theory, and Karen Wetterhahn, who as you know, passed away some years ago, uh, worked on this as a graduate student. The early theory thought that the phenanthrene type double bond, remember this is phenanthrene, we talked about that with regard to that middle ring that's more susceptible to hydrogenation. It's also more susceptible to oxidation. And what people would isolate would be the K region epoxide. And that then reacts with DNA. But now we know, even though this does happen, it's not the proximate carcinogen. It's not the stuff that induces the cancer, even though this does go on. In fact, this may not be in the syllabus, and that's OK. <clears throat> so what does happen now, with any aromatic hydrocarbon that you ingest, your body wants to make it water soluble. We've talked about this before. Benzene is water insoluble. These things are water insoluble. To make them soluble, you introduce oxygen by way of the epoxide first. This then opens up, or maybe it's epoxidized again, but you can imagine the epoxide, we'll just focus on this step, reacts with cysteine, which is an amino acid in all of us, and that makes a water-soluble metabolite. So your body, to get rid of this, wants to make it water-soluble, makes the epoxide, cysteine, and this thing goes out in the urine. And this is what happens when you ingest anything that's water insoluble, that's a foreign chemical, like benzene and all these compounds. But then it took some time to figure out what is the proximate carcinogen in this category? What is the actual compound that reacts with your DNA if it's not the K-region epoxide? Well, it's the epoxy diol shown here. So this step, or this slide and the next slide are the most important ones in this category, I think. If you have a bay region, terminal ring connected to a bay region, as it's called, if it's unsubstituted, you, you get not in one step, but in three steps, you get the epoxy diol. And that's the stuff now that reacts with your DNA. If you block this ring, you abolish the activity. It's no longer a carcinogen. And by blocking, I mean you put a fluorine or a chlorine or methyl in it. You can just take one. If you block any one of the four positions, you abolish the activity. Conversely, if you block this ring, you direct more metabolism to the bad ring, the Bay region ring. You can make the compound more carcinogenic. Because we know now, when you ingest this compound or the benzpyrene, Metabolism occurs at all positions. Your body wants to get rid of it, epoxidize here and there, everywhere, but only if it's epoxidized, as you'll see on the next slide, at this position does that lead to cancer. And that's maybe 10% of the time when you ingest this. It's also epoxidized here, as we just saw, the K region, over here, over here, in the middle ring as well, and it's epoxidized here, that's okay. Only here first, that initiates this path. And that's shown on this slide, I think, after, after this one. So some years ago, Peter Dugler, a 
graduate, you can see 1977, made some compounds. We made this compound where this is now open and it's still mutagenic, which will lead to cancer. We never went that far. But then he found that if you make this compound, now it's not a carcinogen, not a mutagen at all. So this and other evidence then supports this slide. And this is the most important slide for this. So what happens, maybe 10% of the time, if you get epoxidation here, you get this thing. Epoxyhydrase is an enzyme in all of us, and that simply is an enzyme that adds water to the epoxide, as we did on the last exam with the epoxide and HCl. The same idea, you get trans opening the trans diol to give this compound. Okay, now I wanna ask you, what will this do? I'll give you a hint, it, it does epoxidize, but why would it be selective now the second time? Even though the first time it can be epoxidized all around the ring, here it's only epoxidized there. Any thoughts about that? Yeah? The two OHs are activating, so it makes that ring a lot more reactive than it would be otherwise. Basically, that's right. Yeah, this is now like an alkene. These double bonds are aromatic type double bonds, much less reactive. So once you've converted one of the rings, to this epoxide, then the diol, it's predestined now to epoxidize a second time at that ring. And that's the epoxy diol. That then, as it turns out, has the right size and shape and reactivity to react with your DNA. <clears throat> now, it turns out, even the compounds that don't cause cancer, this is called chrysine. This also forms an epoxy diol. In fact, phenanthrene, two, three slides ago, also showed that. It doesn't have the right shape to intercalate DNA. So, it, so two things have to happen. It has to be a, converted to the epoxy diol and have this basic shape, we think, to get into the DNA, position itself for reacting with a guanosine. Now, your DNA is a great nucleophile. It's the largest nucleophile in the world. And the part of DNA that's the most nucleophilic is guanosine, that nitrogen as it turns out. It's actually more than one nitrogen and guanosine that can react. And so here's the evidence. You can take benzpyrene, again, the compound with the extra, extra ring here. Here is the Bay region ring, unsubstituted. Here's the Bay when you have a ring here. And if you don't want to make the epoxidial yourself, that's okay, it's very dangerous. Just let the rat do it, in fact, or the animal. And then you get the guanosine piece of DNA right here stuck to the epoxy diol. Or if you're a good chemist, you would make this in the lab and just in the test tube, feed it to an animal or polyguanosine, where it's a polymer guanosine. And this NH2 then attacks the epoxide ring opening. As you guys have all learned, you get the trans product, nitrogen up, alcohol down attack from the top, and the benzylic carbon, notice that this is a benzylic carbon, this is not. The benzylic carbon is always the site of nucleophilic attack. That's more reactive than the other, other position, as it turns out. And some of these I'll, I'll show on the board when we're all done. Any questions about this? Okay, benzpyrene, as I mentioned, we're breathing this right now. In the wintertime, especially in the upper valley, a lot of benzpyrene comes around from burning wood, firewood. I, I do the same thing. <clears throat> you can see it's also produced by bacteria, we think. It's in cigarette smoke, obviously. And you can calculate about how much you're inhaling. It, it sounds like a lot. Well, it is a lot if you figure out how many molecules are in four nanograms. Don't ever do that because you'll, you'll be scared to death. But it's a very small amount in terms of weight, let me say that. So if you burn anything, you get a lot of these things. Burning acetylene will produce benzpyrene. You know, some amazing mechanisms, obviously. You take this and you get this. You don't have to write that on the final, believe me. So any of these compounds, when burned 700 degrees centigrade, will form benzpyrene. Even methane, amazing process. Methane by itself will form some of this compound. <clears throat> a 
Okay, let's look at some of the sources <clears throat> of these compounds. It's on, on soil, of course. It settles from air plants, automobile exhaust, maybe a natural product in Cape Cod as well. If you cook sausages, microwave is the best way to go. Never use pine cones as a fuel source. You get lots of benzpyrene by comparison. Oh, sorry. One more here. <clears throat> Big city dust, airplane exhaust. So it really is everywhere. But fortunately, and I'll talk about this at the end of this special topic, we have ways to prevent getting cancer, even though we're exposed to these compounds all the time including vitamins we'll talk about. Again, burning wood, the forest fires <coughs> we've talked about, <laughs> bonfires, of course. Yeah. And I, I burn firewood in my house in Norwich. You can see, <coughs> this is still renting, by the way, if anybody needs a place. <laughs> so Vermont, very high, of course, to keep warm in the wintertime. Okay, some other sources in, in air. Big cities, of course, bus garage, diesel exhaust. Outdoor burning, too, because incomplete combustion, the grass, the leaves are wet, you don't get complete conversion to CO2 and water. Garbage burning. Yeah, the record is actually held by a coal tar pitch kettle. If you measure the concentration of benzpyrene just above the surface, you have this enormous concentration of benzpyrene. Even though it's a solid, but of course, it's in the vapor stage at that point. It gets into our food, parts per billion, so it, it's a, a small amount. But if you smoke and eat a lot of burned food all the time and burn wood and clean your chimney, you're exposing yourself to lots of these compounds. Okay, just some more examples. This is now Ben's anthracene as well, which is a little bit less carcinogenic than Ben's pyrene. And you can see how burning food is, leads to higher concentrations of these things. Yeah? Is there any reason why there, it would be in fresh vegetables? No, I don't know. I mean, it is apparently a natural product. Bacteria can also make it, I think. But, but you know, just, just air sources, getting, getting on the vegetables, on the crops, as, as you saw with the Cape Cod soil. Hard to say. Small amounts of, you know, these are the large amounts. If you eat burned food every day, burned toast, for example, barbecued meat, you know, then you're, you're getting a larger concentration of these things. Here's roasted meat, as you can see, and here, here's benzpyrene. Benzanthracene, dibenzanthracene is here. Benzanthracene is here. And the major compound is phenanthrene, actually, which is not a carcinogen. Again, even though it has this shape, it has only three rings, and we know that's not sufficient to be intercalated in the DNA, even though it does undergo epoxidation at various places. You need a fourth ring. If you're a smoker, filtration only takes out about half of the benzpyrene and benzanthracene, as you can see. And lung cancer, of course. Also, these types of tumors are involved with uh, smoking. Okay, it turns out that air pollution is also involved. This is a map of Hamilton, Ontario. This is Lake Ontario. These are the steel mills on Hamilton Bay, and they exude a lot of nasty things like benzpyrene and related things. 
after correcting for lifestyle, people that live here in the shaded area have an incidence of lung cancer of 65 per 100,000. They live out here, it drops down by a third or two thirds, 23, and if they live out here, again, after correcting for lifestyle, it drops way down to 12. So direct indication, they think, that the emissions from the steel mills are causing lung cancer in folks that live here in particular. Also in Los Angeles, a study done a long time ago where a lot of benzpyrene was in the air, more than could be accounted for that from automobile exhaust, and they think it's related to the petroleum industry in these parts of Los Angeles, near the airport, south central LA, and people living there have more lung cancer than, than elsewhere in LA, again, after correcting for uh, their habits. And so apparently directed uh, to air pollution. Okay, any questions about the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons? Okay, let's talk about benzene. Benzene, of course, has only one ring. It, it doesn't cause solid tumors, but is implicated causing leukemias. It gets into your bone marrow, is metabolized, or in your blood. And this was first recognized in the shoe industry in Italy, excuse me, in Turkey, where workers, uh, very bad ventilation, using benzene as a solvent for the glue, making shoes, came down with anemia and also leukemia. It's in gasoline to very small amounts. You can see gasoline, here's benzene. It's not very much compared to all the other alkanes and xylenes. And it's ironic that only benzene causes leukemia. Xylene, ethylbenzene, all these other compounds don't. Does anybody know why that might be? And the hint is that benzene is oxidized as I mentioned before, now to an epoxide, and that, that goes on, as you'll see. But methylbenzene, xylene, or toluene are not carcinogenic, even though they're oxidized. What's the difference, do you think? And this goes back to chapter 16. Well, oxidation occurs on the methyl, the benzylic methyl, very susceptible to oxidation. Potassium permanganate, as you guys all know, is converted to benzoic acid. And you get oxidation here, eventually going to benzoic acid. In the case of xylene, you have the diacid, and that's not a carcinogen. So you, you don't interrupt, you don't uh, perturb the benzene ring, unless it's benzene itself. Benzene is found everywhere. It's been found on the moon. It's the major organic compound from some volcanoes, the major carbon-containing compound out of volcanic emissions is benzene. High concentrations, I mean, this is really, really high concentrations. Lower concentrations, you can see you get these blood diseases. Okay, this slide's important. This slide shows what happens when you're exposed to benzene. Your body's trying to make a water-soluble metabolite. First step is epoxidation. Then it can undergo the NIH shift directly to the phenol. The phenol then is oxidized further, maybe by way of another epoxide. Nobody's ever isolated that, but you get a thing called hydroquinone. And this is the compound that's stored in the sac of the bombardier beetle one of the chambers, the other chamber has an enzyme, and when you pinch that beetle, you don't want to do that, although it's very tiny, it mixes in the chambers and produces benzoquinone. And that's, in fact, the ultimate metabolite of benzene. This is what causes leukemia, the benzoquinone. But again, the bombardier beetle produces very small amounts of this, obviously. What can also happen, though, is you get this epoxidase reaction to give the diol, the diol now can be further oxidized to what's called catechol, and now you have a benzene ring that is really electron rich, like this one, and this can undergo cleavage to a dialdehyde, 
And aldehydes, as you guys know, are very electrophilic, and they too can cause cancer, acid aldehyde, formaldehyde perhaps as well. But this is the major pathway, benzoquinone. That's all you really have to worry about. The evidence for this is that if you take benzoquinone with DNA, and you can make the benzoquinone or buy it, or start with benzene, feed it to an animal, it becomes embedded into deoxyguanosine and deoxyadenosine, two of the four bases in your DNA. That mechanism, you guys could all figure out, I'm sure. What's the first step? Just imagine again, you have NH2 here and NH there. Remember the Aza-Michael reaction? Okay. The first step, NH2, can attack right here. Here we have this alpha-beta unsaturated ketone we had on the last exam and maybe on the next exam. Very common reaction. So that will make this bond. And now this nitrogen attacks the oxygen, the carbonyl, to make an imine. Again, old chemistry that we've had. It's all here. And if you just push electrons around in protons, you can write a structure now for the formation of this and also for this, where the NH2 of adenosine will attack here, Michael addition, and then this nitrogen attacks the carbonyl. Very simple chemistry. And that's, now you've damaged the DNA, obviously, big time. Likewise, you, you can find it here with uh, deoxyguanosine, but I also, that's now the same compound, but this compound as well, you have two carbonyls. That was on the last slide from Catechol. And now you can see the nitrogen, NH2, maybe attacks here, Michael addition here. This nitrogen attacks here, Michael addition there. Old chemistry, Re really simple stuff. You just have to push electrons around to figure out, how to get back the benzene ring. But you guys can all do that. And here's the dialdehyde I mentioned, reacts again with deoxyguanosine. Again, aldehydes react with amines. This one's a little more complicated. And here you, you get the carbonyl amine, which I think will dehydrate as well, as we learned actually last week with reductive amination. Okay, we're just going to start with the second group of compounds. And this is an important class because this class, aromatic amines, has been shown beyond all doubt to cause cancer in man. The other types, we think they do. Benzpyrene, we think it does. Nitrosamines, it's hard to prove cause and effect, but it's known, it's been proven. If the dose is high enough, you will get cancer of the bladder if you're exposed to these compounds. But once again, we have a group of compounds that are carcinogenic. And this one used to be used as an unknown in Chem 52 years ago, this one as well, before we realized that. Uh, before my time, too, before my time, I should say that. The nitro compound that has the same arrangement of rings, in fact, is also carcinogenic, all of these. These are not carcinogenic. Even though if you look at the, well, what's the difference? They're about the same. These are not carcinogenic. The ones in the previous slide are. So what's different about these? Ones on the left don't cause cancer. Ones on the right do. Again, very interesting structure activity relationships. What's the difference? Anybody see that? Yeah. It's just the placement of the substituent. Right, right. So what, can you go a little further about that? Uh, it's close, it's close, yeah. If you have, in fact, a blocked para position, then it will cause cancer in the aromatic amine category. It has to do now with where metabolism occurs, which we're gonna see tomorrow, not today. If you have an open para position, and by open I mean H, para to the nitrogen, then it will not be carcinogenic, and it has to do with where it's metabolized in the ring.